<clears throat> oh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Emory's Living with Dementia webinar series. And this is brought to you through a uh, generous grant from the Guazetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, um, the Emory Cognitive Neurology and Integrated Memory Care Clinics. Uh, really wanted to provide you with wonderful topics that we feel are important to you and that have been brought to us by you. My name is Alice Cooper. I am one of the social workers in the Cognitive Neurology Clinic, and I am joined by my colleagues, Ashley Varner, uh, who's also in the Cognitive Clinic, and Jenny Gay, who is in the Integrated Memory Care Clinic. Um, what we'd like to do is to make sure that you know you can reach out in terms of questions to the question and answer box, the Q&A box down usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, please make the questions known when you're, when you're thinking about them. You don't have to wait until the end, which is when the uh, Jenny, I'm sorry, not Jenny, but Ashley will be going through the questions and providing them to our speaker. And so uh, until uh, then, please, Jenny, please introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, y'all. Great to be with you. My name is Jenny Gay, and I'm the clinical social worker for the Integrated Memory Care Clinic here in Cognitive Neurology. I have the pleasure of introducing a wonderful occupational therapist in our community who I have long respected um, and have seen do really impactful, wonderful work with um, elders and many different folks in our community. So I am so happy to introduce Cynthia Lowry, um, occupational therapist. She has been licensed as an occupational therapist for 27 years and specializes in healthcare for seniors. She is clinically trained to assess a person's ability to perform everyday activities despite any physical, cognitive, psychological, or emotional limitations they may have. She evaluates the environment in which people live and identifies obstacles that hinder or may that hinder or may hinder their ability to maintain their independence or ability to be cared for at home. And so I am going to let Cynthia take it away. And again, such a pleasure to have you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thanks for inviting me to come and speak. I am going to share my screen. And it went away. Since we do know it was just up, I need to pull it up again. Okay. There we go. All right, thank you all so much for having me. Um, again, if you do have any questions, just, uh, we'll, we'll get to them at the end. I'll try to hopefully answer as much as I can. Um, and she already gave me, already said how, um, how I've been asked. I've been working with the elder uh, population for about 27 years. I currently work for Enable Home Solutions, where we do go out and do home safety assessments and help people uh, age in place and maximize independence. We do caregiver training. Um, I also work for St. Joseph's uh, in the acute care setting as well. So the things we're going to be talking about today is, first of all, just to kind of give you an overview of what occupational therapy is. Um, I do not help people get jobs. Um, so this is just give you a kind of a quick overview on that. Uh, we'll talk about the barriers to aging in place. And I, and I mean by that aging wherever you are right now and want to be able to stay. Um, and then how occupational therapy can help with home and activity modifications using some do-it-yourself ideas 
low tech, high tech assistive technology, and then um, also has some uh, resources that will be able to be shared with you all. So just as a quick overview, occupational therapy basically looks at all those things we tend to take for granted until they're harder to do. The taking care of yourself kinds of things, but then also leisure activities and things that you want to still be able to have in your life. Um, we look at those things, help to figure out ways that you can still participate in those things, maximizing your independence in them, whether it be through recovery of skills, using modifications or adaptations, um, whether it be in an, for an acute illness or chronic illness. So first of all, the challenges. Uh, the challenges with aging and aging in place is number one, the environment. The nation's hate housing stock does not fit the realities of a changing and aging America. Your home may not be the safe haven that you need it to be as you're dealing with challenges, whether it be physical and or cognitive. The cost of moving may be completely prohibitive. Um, and right now, many of our homes have small bathrooms, narrow doorways, lots of steps. Houses were built long before um, the ADA or the concept of universal design. The aging process in and of itself um, and in that, the increased risk of falls. Falls do not have to be a normal part of aging. There are changes that occur with aging, varied in severity and in timing for every person, but they all do increase the risk of falls as we age. And we know them. Changes in vision, hearing, balance, flexibility and strength, changes in memory and cognitive function. The CDC says about one out of every four people over the age of 65 fall each year and the cost of these falls, both for the nation and for each person individually, financially and emotionally is staggering. Falls can have a spiraling effect by increasing fear of social activity and of physical activity and can increase some of the challenging be, uh, dementia related behaviors. And then also another area uh, that can be a challenge when um, with the goal of trying to age in place and age as we want to be able to age is uh, the difficulty, physical, emotional, financial demands on caregivers. The home environment may not be helping the situation and the caregiver's own aging process may be affecting their ability to provide care. Just some interesting statistics as far as um, in 2020, how many um, people provided unpaid care to an adult. Um, and then $470 billion in 2013 was the value of unpaid caregiving, which exceeded the value of paid home care and Medicaid total um, in that same year. So, ways to overcome the challenges. We've all heard, stay physically active, perform balance exercises, have your vision and your hearing checked regularly, learn about the side effects of your medications and talk to your doctor about them. Within that is know that underlying medical conditions or infections can affect a person's um, cognition. Interestingly, just working in the acute care side, at St. Joseph's as well, how many times we have somebody who comes in with a UTI and their um, cognitive deficits increase. And that's the first sign um, that they even have an infection and then um, it can improve after treatment. Uh, get enough sleep. Obviously with falls, um, if there's any orthostatic hypotension, you wanna stand up slowly and then count to three before walking. And that also for going from lying down to sitting up, same thing is taking it slowly. If an assistive device has been recommend, recommended for you, we do recommend that it be used. This may not though always be possible with somebody with cognitive deficits. And we do understand that. And that's where OT sometimes fit in um, and, and help the situation after maybe a physical therapist has recommended a walker. And then in reality, we know that that's not so easily done once the person is home and in their environment and can't remember to use the walker um, or 
doesn't want to use a walker and refuses to. Um, so other modifications need to be looked at um, and each individual person, there may be some other things that can be done. Um, and then definitely where OT fits in um, is to modify your home activity and or caregiver methods to decrease risk for falls and enhance and maximize function based on cognitive and physical needs. So we'll start talking about some of those modifications. First of all, it's just the reminder that not all modifications are helpful. This is just a, a, a picture of one that is obviously not helpful. And that, that goes to lots of modifications. Just because it's a modification, just because it says it is on Amazon does not mean it's helpful for that person. Everybody's needs are different. The plan must be individualized. Uh, just because a piece of equipment helped your friend's husband does not mean it'll help your husband. A physical need, kind of what I was talking about with the walker, this is that's just one example. A physical need for a piece of equipment may not fit with a person's cognitive need for a modification. So it goes back to the fact that each person, it, there needs to be an individual assessment to make sure what fits for that person. And it could also be that a physical need for a walker or a wheelchair may not fit with the environmental needs. Maybe um, that walker or wheelchair won't fit into a bathroom. Well, then we got to figure out what to do with that bathroom. More is not always better. Here's a picture of one where more is definitely not always better. No need for all those grab bars. In regards to the environment, too many devices or changes can be confusing. In the same line, overstimulation and excess clutter should be avoided. In regards to activity modification, too many changes. Um, that aren't natural uh, could decrease follow through. And in regards to directions provided by a caregiver, they also, more is not always better. Directions should be direct, simple, one-step cues, avoiding abstract and open-ended questions. Um, an example of that, Let's say uh, it's time for mom uh, to get ready um, because a caregiver daughter has to get out of the house. The example um, between the two different options. Mom, I have a lot to do today before your doctor appointment at noon. We need to leave in 30 minutes. Can you please get ready to go? Versus mom, it's time to get dressed. When it, provide as many one-step simple cues as possible. Okay, so we'll start with some um, low tech and kind of do it yourself. Environmental modifications. On the line of, of pretty simple things you can do to decrease fall risks around the house. We've all heard it, remove throw rugs. Everyone likes their throw rugs, especially in the bathroom. If those are going to be kept, then definitely replacing them with non-slip rugs. That means good rubber on the bottom, but limiting their use of them. Um, and definitely around the house, just removing them. Area rugs are different. They're secured by furniture. Um, they're much larger and tend to be much, they, they won't be slippery because they're being held by furniture, but those edges can be secured with carpet tape. Uh, if nighttime is an issue with what you're putting on your feet, if there's slipping, um, non-slip socks at night are great. You can even get some that have the rubber kind of on both sides. So if they move around and sleep, then they, um, that's okay. But you always pretty much anytime want to avoid backless slip-on shoes. They tend to encourage shuffling and um, they, you can come out of them just too easily causing a fall risk. Create clear pathways. This is in the realm of decreasing 
fall and, and trip hazards, but also decreasing overstimulation, um, just for better to remove um, clutter overall. And, and then obviously keeping those pathways clear, you may need to remove electrical cords from pathways, rearrange where devices are plugged in, um, things like that to make sure that uh, the tripping hazard or hazards are removed. Add lighting uh, for safety and also for orientation, wherever possible, natural light is better. Add directed light to the task at hand. Motion sensor lighting can be a great way of helping uh, improve safety during nighttime voiding. They can be easily added to baseboards or walls with double-sided tape and they're battery operated. They automatically turn on as you walk by and turn off um, when the motion stops. There's a, you can make any lamp nowadays also a smart lamp by um, plugging in the lamp into a device and then that goes into the wall and then you, a remote control can be used from bedside. And that depends on each person if that seems a natural change by adding a remote control or a button to push um, to turn on the light when they get up at night. Stairways, definitely clutter should be removed from stairways add motion sensor lighting, add anti-slip tape to wood stairs and or contrasting colored tape. We've already talked about that as we get older, the vision decreases in that usually depth perception decreases. That's why thresholds with um, you know, little lips and things can become more difficult. If you ever stand at the top of your stairway, and this happens a lot in wood stairs, and especially like in this picture where you're going then onto a wood floor as well, and it's all the same color, stand at the top and look down. And even without visual deficits, you'll see where it's really difficult to see the edge of the step and where the next one begins. So adding some um, anti-slip tape, contrasting color to the stairs can help add handrails, Obviously, if you don't want someone going up or down the steps at night, especially um, installing a gate at the top or the bottom of the stairway, and they don't have to look anymore like a child gate. Um, the one in the picture here, um, they can be pretty easily made and added um, and make it look seamless with the rest of the stairway. Other just more general tips to maximize independence as much as possible, you wanna maintain a routine. This will help if there's any progression of any um, dementia or cognitive impairment to have a routine set. Of course, not to be so rigid that as needs change that, that the routine can't be modified because that can be a really easy kind of um, way to improve function by modifying things a little bit, but the concept of routine should always be there. You want to limit choices offered, obviously, as um, more progression, then that's even more, um, more uh, beneficial. But for example, instead of asking uh, mom what she wants for lunch, giving, providing two choices, would you like soup or would you like salad? And avoid overstimulation in general, whether it be auditory, visual, tactile, um, just avoiding overstimulation some simple, simple things. Um, it doesn't, everything doesn't have to be electronic, right? Uh, directional and informational signs using a large wall calendar that somebody can write on to help people um, know what's coming up that day. This is a picture of some um, grab bars that are out on the market. They don't have, grab bars do not have to look like institutional grab bars. This is a really nice way if somebody insists on always pulling up on that toilet paper roll or on a towel rack, and you know that that's just always going to be where somebody is going to hold on to, then add a grab bar there instead. These are installed. They are grab bar installed, right? So they, nowadays, you do not have to get both sides of a grab bar, just as a side note, into studs, ideally one side would be in a stud, but that's not even completely required, depends on the, um, the wall, but, but into 
one side into a stud, the other side can be used, a secure mount can be used. Um, it's an, a special way of, of mounting the other side. <laughs> Toileting, um, just in general, it is typically easier for someone to sit and stand from a surface that is slightly more firm, slightly higher, and with two armrests. So that's why like the middle of a couch is the hardest thing to stand from. A toilet can sometimes be very difficult to stand from, especially because um, they may be low um, especially in older homes. Um, and there may not be something next to the person to hold on to. So there's lots of ways of modifying a toilet. This is one that it completely depends on the setup of that person's bathroom. There are pros and cons to pretty much everything here. And uh, sometimes it can be as easy. Somebody really doesn't want to change their toilet. They like their toilet. They don't want to change the seat. Then if there's a wall next to it, adding a grab bar, you know, one of those toilet paper holder grab bars or, or whatever that can, um, that can be enough for some people, right? Somebody who's 5'2 is going to have a different need than somebody who's six foot as far as height. Um, also knowing how somebody does you're going to make a different decision if it's somebody who always sits to go versus somebody who does like to still stand. Um, you may need a grab bar at, behind the toilet or up higher next to the toilet um, if it's something that they need to hold on to while standing. There are some toileting aids that can help. The squatty potty, which I'm sure most people have heard of, that just allows for still both feet to be flat on the floor in a better position if you do have to raise the toilet <clears throat> to um, help with the sitting and standing part. Bidets can be very helpful for people who are diff having difficulty with hygiene, still allows independence, uh, even if there's some shoulder range of motion issues or uh, thoroughness issues. Um, bidets can be added. You don't have to change the whole toilet. They can be added to, um, to pretty much any toilet. Doorways can be easily modified using threshold ramps. Uh, this might decrease fall risk, trip hazards, but also help if there's a roll device that needs to be going in and out of the door. The offset door hinges can help widen a door frame without any construction needed. It adds about uh, an inch or two, depending on each, depending on the door and everything, but adds about an inch or two to the door, doorway. Beds, this has been one of the shocking things to me or surprising, I should say, things to me as I've done more work in people's homes, but also seeing it in acute care, is the difficulty people have with bed mobility as they age and with um, more and more physical problems, bed mobility becomes very difficult. There's a lot of caregiver going in and helping and pulling and um, you know a lot of effort to get up and down. Again, generally, we do recommend, it's, and also that being said, it tends to be an area where falls um, occur, common area, um, along with the bathroom, obviously, but the bed and slipping off the edge of the bed, especially in the middle of the night. We do generally say that it is better if somebody, while they're sitting on the edge of the bed, that their feet can be planted on the floor. And that can help with that, um, the tendency to slip off in the middle of the night. One way to lower a bed really easily without having to change the whole um, bed frame or anything is if there is a, an average box spring, which usually is between five and eight inches in, um, in height that you can replace that with a low profile box spring and that'll bring down the mattress quite significantly. Bed rails can be helpful. I do not recommend bed rails to keep somebody in the bed, right? So no full length bed rails along the side. These are um, mobility assist devices only and not to keep somebody in the bed. Um, the, these types of mobility assist bed rails they, you do have to check for safety every once in a while to make sure they are uh, fully against the mattress and tightened 
um, but they can really be very, and only at the head of the bed, but they can be very helpful with bed mobility, uh, rolling and getting in and out. Adjustable beds are an option. Again, each individual person um, has their needs with this, but they can be helpful for bed mobility, but also in um, any progression of needs with um, caregiving uh, assistance that may be needed later on or um, to get in and out of bed. Other ways of making a home more accessible, using stair lifts um, is, is a known one. Ramps, you can do modular ramps. They don't have to be the built wood ramps, modular ramps that can be changed, can be removed easily. The, um, the, uh, the handrails on the brick steps there, those were just purchased from Amazon and added. Um, pretty easily by a handyman. Bathtubs, uh, walk-in showers are usually e easier to get in and out of, but not always. Sometimes there's real uh, confining aspects to your shower, depending on each home, because of the door, because there's no real wall next to it that you can add a grab bar. So, you know, each individual bathroom will need um, different modifications to make them as safe as possible. Bathtubs specifically can be difficult, the stepping over the side of the tub. Obviously grab bars can assist, but the easy fix is the tub transfer bench at that top right-hand corner. Um, that eliminates the need to step over the side at all. You can, there are companies out there that can come in and take out the tub, put in a prefab shower. It's a quick one to two day, um, modification. It's not cheap, but it is cheaper than renovating an entire bathroom. If somebody still does like to get into um, and soak in a tub, but is having more difficulty getting up, which tends to be uh, where that difficulty will lie if somebody is still soaking, you can do a mechanical lift like in that bottom right hand corner that can just bring you down and bring you right back up. I do tend to like those a little bit more than the walk in tub uh, concept, but again, each person is um, is different. All right, so on the higher tech side. Um, so uh, back to the, the, the bed um, issue, there aren't, there's no perfect option um, for getting the information that a caregiver may need that somebody is getting out of bed when you don't want them to, or at least to be alerted when somebody is getting out of bed. Um, I like this, um, it's called the safe wanderer, this, uh, the top picture. It's a wearable wireless sensor. It sends an alert to caregiver's phone when the wearer starts to get up from bed um, or a chair or, or wherever that you want to have it on and uh, wherever you need. Um, there are bed alarms that I'm sure most of you are aware of or know they exist. There are pros and cons, they can be sometimes too sensitive to where they alarm with every movement. Sometimes they're not sensitive enough. It can depend on how a person sleeps and lies on it. Um, not to say that it's not an appropriate modification for some people, um, but they're not as easy as, as they're made out to be. And they can be very alarming to the person with a sound, with a too loud of a auditory. Uh, some you can modify that and it just alarms in a caregiver's room. And, you know, so there are pros and cons to all of these. Obviously there are in-home video monitor systems. Um, most people know about medical alert systems. They definitely medical alert systems. There's lots of companies out there. They can be and should be, again, individualized for each person, whether it be a necklace or a, a watch concept, or, you know, are you at home or are you leaving? I do recommend if, especially if people are 
leaving the house at all is to have uh, fall detection and GPS capability. So that those are just features that you then um, add on to and their prices range a little bit. There are monthly fees for all of them. And in the resource page, I have uh, provided a link to a website that um, compares the different companies. The iPhone and Apple Watch, always get this question. Um, the Apple Watch does have fall detection. You can also have uh, an app added called Boundary Care, uh, which is location monitoring. It can, you can set up geo zones, you can get alerts to caregivers. Um, it, it does quite a bit, but what I will say about smartphones, iPhones, Apple, anything, any type of smartphone, if somebody is used to using one, has always used one, has used one for years, absolutely. Um, that would be the first thing probably I would even try with some of these um, safety type options that iPhones have. Um, you can use calendar reminders, reminder apps, you can use alarms and timers. And there's lots of things that, that uh, smart devices provide. What I would say though, is that it shouldn't, I would recommend usually that it not be an, a thing that's added once a diagnosis has been made to add an, an Apple product at that point is probably not the best option for most people. Um, but if somebody is used to using it, then absolutely there's lots of features to Apple products and other smartphones that can be very helpful. Again, it needs to be individualized and figured out what works. And um, you know, even if it's somebody's used to using an iPhone, but have way too many apps as their aging and um, things are becoming a little more difficult. They're used to using the phone, but now they're overwhelmed by how many apps. Well, that's an easy modification or adaptation, right? Get rid of the ones that aren't being used and then really focus in on the ones that can really help. Uh, kitchen safety, always uh, an issue and a, and a question. Um, there are nothing again, um, as we all know, pretty much anything, uh, nothing is perfect. Lots of, there are lots more out there though on the market than there used to be. The iGuard stove there in the top right um, is great. It's an automatic stove shut off device. So it does shut off the stove. It has a timer. It has a pause button. If somebody leaves the area for too long while the stove is on, it can be uh, remotely monitored and settings changed. It can be set up for gas stoves. That does have to be done by a plumber versus an, versus an electric stove. It's a little bit easier to personally set up, but it is a pricier item. The iGuard stove in general is pretty pricey. Um, versus something like the Fire Avert also shuts off the stove, um, but it's hooked up to the, the smoke alarm. So it only shuts off the stove once the smoke alarm has been activated. So obviously a little later in the, um, in the situation. The, um, the simple touch there with the, the coffee, pot, those are automatic shutoffs, but for smaller appliances like coffee pots and curling irons. Um, the Tosh Tech smart turn knobs in the right um, corner, that is a, a new device that I recently in the past year have um, come across and actually um, purchased one so I could try one at my house to make sure that I liked it. Um, it's it's interesting. It, it, it basically, basically turns your stove to a smart stove. So the you do have to change out the knobs. It's a little bit of a setup, but um, but it has a sensor and a an alarm that goes off in your um, kitchen if, if you leave the kitchen for too long once those knobs are turned on. So it does not turn off the stove, but it does alarm um, visually and auditorily and um, and then can alert uh, caregivers family that you through an app that um, and you can see 
when the, the caregiver can see when the stove is turned on and can kind of monitor that. So still in the realm of maximizing independence, um, lots of pill organizers uh, for medication management definitely is an issue uh, to really maintaining that independence. Um, there are different, again, kind of levels and cost um, for modifications. The hero, which is in the um, on the right hand side, the top right. It is not only a pill dispenser, but it does um, perform the med management type task as well. It gives notifications. It holds 90 days of supply. It communicates with caregivers um, and that's all through an app. It, it has a lot of features, but there is a monthly fee for it. So that that's kind of on the pricier side versus ones like Reminder Rosie and Med Center Pill Organizer um, with Reminder System. Those all have the, they're smaller devices. So there are sometimes issues with the, the dexterity needed for then the pill management because they're smaller. They don't have as many um, days that they can keep also. And some have issue with how many pills. And, you know, so all of those things really have to be, again, individualized for each person and what works. Um, again, if somebody is already uh, independent with an Apple product. There is the MediSafe app, which has also a lot of features for um, medication management. It has, um, first of all, you can put in an unlimited amount of meds. It gives reminders. It talks about, it gives you drug interaction alerts. So let's say you add a drug that a doctor has prescribed and it is an inter has an interaction with a drug that you already have in the program, it will alert you. Um, and also caregivers can, um, and family members can um, be involved in the app so they can monitor. Clocks are a, a, a tech option um, that are very simple and a way to make sure that a person um, has a independent way of maintaining orientation. Don't recommend quizzing somebody to see if they remember the date, time, and, and year, and all of that kind of stuff. I say that always knowing that in the hospital, <laughs> when I go in and, and see, I always hate it, but I have to uh, initially is, is test orientation. Um, but I, I, I tend to be, uh, versus the younger therapist, funny when knowing that most of the people I go in and see are retired and really may not know the actual date. Um, the younger therapists always count off for that one. And, and I do not. <laughs> uh, once somebody is retired, I always give a little leeway there. But um, so I have to quiz then, but I do not recommend that um, people get quizzed on orientation regularly. And I believe that the information should be provided in an easy way so people can keep track of it on their own. Um, there are automatic pet feeders out there. Um, again, we've already talked about the use of smart device and all of the features that they have are great. Again, if somebody is already used to using a smart device. Okay, and um, communication. Um, the same company, Tosh Tech, uh, has a device that is somewhat like an Amazon Echo where messages can be recorded and uh, played back uh, regularly. So in this case, it's showing that, um, that there's a reminder to, for mom to take her medication at 9 a.m. So it goes off at 9 a.m every day so that and those the benefit there you can send the reminders it can be modified through an app uh, you can change them um, you can you know do something instantly you know whatever you want so those are that's kind of nice the adapted telephones the the ras memory in the top left is a cell phone it's easy to use a picture phone 
one screen with uh, contacts and pictures. There's 911 capability, but there's also ways of modifying that so, you, so there's not too many excessive um, 911 calls. The grand pad uh, is easy to use, communication pad, it's colorful buttons, large font, just has a few apps for calls, emails, music, news, games, all of those kinds of wanted items. But then it also does, is able to, you're able to block spam and scam emails. There's a monthly fee uh, for that. The Amazon Echo, uh, the view clicks, is a smart picture frame uh, in that bottom right-hand corner. Family members can call in for video calls, send photos, put in reminder notes. It is just one way though. The, um, the senior uh, cannot initiate calls on it. All right, and then uh, here are some links. I don't know, I would assume that um, they, you know, this can be given, um, but these are just some of the links from some of the equipment that I recommended uh, or that I, I talked about. Um, again, when I say recommend it is individualized. So again, not all of these will work for everyone. Um, I, I do not have the low tech ones on here, but if you have any questions about that or if somebody does, you, you, my email um, can be provided and I can answer some of those simple questions for you about the low tech things. And that is it. Cynthia, thank you so much. That was just a fantastic, fantastic presentation. And um, like Jenny, I've, uh, I always look forward to your presentations because I learned so much. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's just so nice to have somebody who keeps up with the, the latest and greatest because new stuff is coming out all the time. Um, I uh, there were um, a few questions. One was how do we get uh, a hold of the resource page that you mentioned? Um, uh, sometimes we're able to send out the PDF of of the slideshow. Would that be okay with you? To yeah, do that? that's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. So mm -hmm. attendees, I'll be sending out the PDF to everyone. To the address that you signed in with. Um, uh, the, the formatting isn't perfect, but the information is all there. Um, I, you sent it in Keynote. If you so. want, I, I can also just send you that list from the bottom and include, I can include, I just didn't include it in this, the kind of do it yourself ones. I can just send those to you separately if you want, and then you can email just those sheets out if that's yeah. easier. That'd be great. Sure. That would be wonderful mm -hmm. if you're able to do that. Um, another question that we got was, um, my husband is mostly bed bound. Um, we have a Hoyer lift and a power chair, um, but he is fixated on walking again. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all he talks about. And so this is sort of that, that place that you just fit so perfectly, Cynthia. Um, and she and she says and distraction hasn't worked. Um, what do I do? Um, so I, I if you have any ideas, I know that that folks would appreciate. Yeah, sure. So I guess, you know, just some background. I don't know if he has participated in therapy, if there is a physical obviously along with cognitive issues that are limiting the walking and how long it's been. I guess those are the things that, you know, to really get a true understanding. But in general, um, there are ways, uh, the Hoyer lifts are difficult for most people because it really it become, it's a dependent, it's a dependent device, completely dependent. So the person has taken away all of their, um, control of that situation. So it is very difficult for lots of people. And there are in between devices that can be used. And again, it totally depends on the person where a person could still participate in, let's say, the standing in a controlled way, but then still be physically helped and moving. And that's a special stand assist device that is often um, beneficial when somebody is in a pretty low 
level state for um, for mobility. Um, other than that, as far as you know, keeping somebody, it, it would also be you know, could it be that they're able to sit on the side of the bed and participate in a more active way versus always being lying down? Um, so little things like that. That's a hard one to say specifically without having all of that background information. Um, sometimes we do see as therapists where when there's been such a history of falls, the answer is to keep them in bed. Um, and there could be an in-between. I'll, ju I'll just say that. And so I would recommend that um, the person talk with their, um, or, you know, contact me separately. Um, and I can get a little bit more background information and then help if it's maybe a little therapy, or maybe we need to go with some other modifications. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Another question that I got from somebody who was really bummed that they had a conflict, mm -hmm. um, was, um, uh, and you, you, you got at this, but I just want to, um, voice it. What is the best GPS for wandering? Mm -hmm. We used to use his phone, but now he doesn't take his phone with him. Um, uh, same thing with 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 the watch. So there, I think they're at the place where they're looking for something that can be pinned on, or um, that the person doesn't have to be aware that they have with them. Do right. you have any thoughts on that? So the medical alert systems are great they do have to be worn so it's got to be something that if a necklace is okay or a watch that he can keep on all the time so it can get wet it can get you know so it's just kept on him um but but correct it needs to be kept on him something that's not removed so i like the watch for that reason because people tend to not like to wear a necklace while they're sleeping let's say so um so that could be an option and there are GPS capabilities with those. And yes, the price differs if you add GPS to a medical alert system. Um, the other, there are, um, there are wandering type monitors that you can do within the home. Um, so whether it be alarms at the door, things like that. So that way you're alerted before they even get out the door. Um, so that, so that's one way. Um, and again, that also differs depending on whether somebody is at home with him or this is from, you need alert to a family member outside the home. So that would be different depending on each situation, but there are alarms for doors. Um, and then um, that safe wanderer, um, that is a way of alerting when somebody gets up out of bed or gets out of a chair, um, and that can be alerted to a caregiver that is not at home. It's alerted through their iPhone. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? It does. I'm looking forward to looking into that safe wander. That's, yeah. that's a, new, a new tool for, um, for my toolkit. Um, another question that um, came in is, um, where can we order the low profile box spring? Mm -hmm. uh, mattress firm. Um, Amazon has some, you have to just look mattress firm. I like because it comes already put together. There are some low profile low profile box springs that you can get on Amazon also, but some of them you just have to look, you may have to actually uh, build it. Um, so they are, it's basically like wood, it is wood slats, right? So you're, um, but the mattress firm one comes already built. And if I am not mistaken, it's two inches. You, there are some that you can get on Amazon that are four inches. So you just have to kind of look at, how many inches you need to lower the bed, um, but it can be a huge help. And uh, uh, from the same person, uh, where can the mobility assist bed rail be ordered? The oh, the bed rails. Also, Amazon. I love Amazon. <laughs> they can, it, you know, you get things right to your door. Um, so yes. So when you look up, there are lots of options for bed rails. 
Um, what I tend to look at, so if you on in Amazon, and I'm just assuming at this point that most people are on, on, are on Amazon, if you do not shop online, then um, um, I think Lowe's and Home Depot carry some, um, Bed Bath & Beyond maybe, but Amazon, if you can get a family member to do it, uh, is probably your easiest bet. But if you just on Amazon look for bed rails for elderly, so it kind of takes away some of the child systems that are longer along the side. Um, uh, I tend to avoid ones that are really long. Like I said, I also avoid ones that have legs down to the floor only because I don't want to add a trip hazard. Um, the ones that go just in between the bed, the mattress and the box spring, you come with a strap that you can then go around the box spring to really secure it because they do need to be up against the mattress and need to be checked regularly that it's still up against the mattress and hasn't loosened. Um, and it should be put towards the head of the bed. Lots of really good information. Um, uh, another question that came in was, um, my mom has advanced dementia and she's constantly moving, but she's no longer steady on her feet. Uh, she doesn't remember that she needs the walker. So I end up chasing her around trying to put the walker in front of her. Do you have any suggestions or tips? Um, so some, and I don't know if she's has just the regular, um, metal walker or the rollator type with the seats and the brake. Um, but, and it sounds like probably, um, in this situation, there's kind of 24 hour mm -hmm. supervision kind of eyes on in a, in a general sense. So, um, a couple things, sometimes a rollator people will remember more um, because it seems more normal than a whole, the metal one that's a little clunky. So um, if that hasn't been tried, you can always try one of those instead. Um, looking at where she tends to be, is it one room? Um, is it the entire house? Is it, um, you know, so if it's one room that she tends to stay in, then really looking at the modification, at what can be done to that room to make it safe if she were to get up. If you, because it's no caregiver can be 24 hours eyes on, that's impossible. So, um, you know, can the room she's in be modified? Things out of the way, rugs change, what's on her feet to make sure that if she were to get up, can she make it those? five steps to the bathroom. Can a grab bar be added on the wall where she always goes to the bathroom? Can, um, you know, just things like that. Can the environment be modified to the most it can be to keep her safe if she were to eventually get up? Sometimes also, and I say this only for those that really do have a caregiver around and can um, yeah, monitor it, is some people do just need to move. Um, so can she be put into a um, transport wheelchair and she tool around with her feet around the house? Um, so that way she's moving, um, but she's not gonna fall. Um, but I only say that obviously for someone who does have that caregiver around for when she doesn't want to get up from the, because she's not gonna, put on brakes and, and make sure it's safe to stand up. So, um, but it'll allow some movement, um, especially when the caregiver is just trying to get something done and can't, can't be assisting the entire time. These are great ideas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question just came in. My husband has dementia along with REM sleep disorder. Um, so he sometimes acts out his dreams in addition to lowering the mattress in case he jumps out of bed or rolls out. Is there anything else I should do to our room to keep him safe in the nighttime if he is asleep and acting out his dreams? Um, you know, that, that, that's a tough one. Um, you can, you know, look at what's around as far as, you know, does a bedside table need to be moved or padded? Um, does, you know, there are pros and cons for putting pads on the floor. You may hear 
somebody say that you could put a pad on the floor for your own. Um, so you're alerted, um, but it's auditory um, and it could jolt him awake. So I don't know the pros and cons on that one. I don't know enough about the side of, you know, that part, the medical side of things, if that would be bad, if we were to be jolted awake by an auditory alarm, um, because you can do that to where if he gets up out of bed and then the bed alarm occurs, um, if that would be beneficial or not. Um, definitely having um, a, a bed rail um, and some type of device if you need to be alerted that he's getting up and moving. Um, but on the medical side of things, I don't know enough about, you know, how to manage the, the REM sleep disorder, if there's something else that could be done medication wise. That's a great one to co collaborate with your, your care provider as well as with uh, Cynthia's group or other OTs. We have one last question, Cynthia. I know you have a hard stop at one yeah. because you got important family matters. Yes. <laughs> um, but one last question that just came in: it, um, Are slipper socks with grips okay, or should a person always wear slippers when it comes to fall prevention? I like slipper socks with the the um, the rubber. You know, the ones you get in the hospital, right? I like those. Um, I think it's a great solution as long as someone is you know, able to walk and okay to walk. You know, some people with some foot issues uh, have to wear shoes all the time, but obviously that's dependent on each situation, you know, like sores and, and things like that. Um, but as far as generally, I like the slipper socks. I think it's a great solution for nighttime voiding, especially um, they do have socks that have the rubber on both sides. So that way, if it moves around at night while you're sleeping, you still pretty much you're always going to have rubber on the bottom of your foot when you get up. Awesome. Cynthia, thank you so very much. You're a wealth of information. And this is this is one of my favorite um, lectures. So really appreciate you giving us your time today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll get you those. It'll be later today after my family event. They'll get you that um, the resource pages. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Everyone.